Welcome to the Food Junkies Podcast. Here, we aim to provide you with the experience, strength, and hope of professionals actively working on the front lines in the field of food addiction. The purpose of our show is to educate you, the listener, and increase overall awareness about food addiction as a disease with abstinence as the solution. Here, we talk about all things recovery. Most importantly, how to thrive rather than just survive. So stay positive, make a change for yourself, tell others about your change, and hopefully the message will spread. Hey guys, Molly here. Today, Vera sat down for a solo interview with Dr. David T. Courtright, Presidential Professor Emeritus at the University of North Florida. David Courtright specializes in drug history. He also writes about violence, political and policy history, aviation, and frontier environments. He has taught medical U.S. and world history at the University of North Florida. Courtright has published influential books on drug use and drug policy, both in American and world history, the social problems of frontier environments on the land and in the air, and the culture war that roiled American politics during the and after the 1960s. Whether it's about drugs, violence, aerospace, or cultural politics, his research is concerned with power, policy, and social structure. His ambition is to identify what drives fundamental changes in modern social and political history. Court Wright's teachings and research have been recognized by the John A. Delaney Presidential Professorship, the UNF Distinguished Professor Award, five teaching awards, the College on Problems of Drug Dependence Media Award, and fellowships from the American Historical Association, NASA, the American Council of Learned Societies, and the National Endowment for the Humanities, including a 2016 to 2017 NEH Public Scholar Award. In today's episode, Vera and David talk about the personal. How did Dr. Courtright get into the history of addiction, limbic capitalism, and pleasure circuitry? What is the food industry? Digital addiction, activism and awareness of addiction, sugar taxes and public policy, Dr. Courtright's latest book, The Age of Addiction, How Bad Ab- Habits Became Big Business, Consumerist Dystopia, Harm Reduction, Solutions, What's Next, and our signature question. Welcome, David. Welcome to the Food Junkies podcast. I am your host today, uh, Dr. Vera Tarman, and today we talk to Dr. David Courtright. David Courtright is a University of North Florida professor emeritus of history whose focus of study has been on the study of drug use, drug policy, and public health. His research addresses how history has influenced our drug use and how our drug use um, has contributed to shaping history. He is the author of four books, Forces of Habit, Drugs in the Making of the Modern World, Addicts Who Survived, An Oral History of Narcotic Use in the United States, Dark Paradise, A History of Opiate Addiction in America, and most recently, The Age of Addiction, How Bad Habits Become Big Business. In these books, he draws upon the historical, scientific, literary, and public policy references to show how drug use over four centuries has been forged by market forces as well as cultural habits. We at Food Junkies Podcast are keen to see how processed food, seen in the context of being a drug food, has enabled thousands of us to develop food addiction, especially in the 21st century, and to see how food addiction fits into the larger historical and cultural perspective perspective of substance use and abuse. So having said all of that, welcome, David. Thanks, Vera. It's great to be here. Thank you. So we always like to start with the personal. What got you interested in the whole story of the history of psychoactive drug use and drug policy? It's a pretty interesting niche. How did you get into it? Wow. Short answer to that question would be Richard Nixon. Oh, my gosh. And and his innovative drug war. I was a graduate student in the 1970s. I ended up at Rice University working on a Ph.D. in history. And I was very interested in legal history and medical history and social history. And I was casting about for a dissertation topic. And we'd just gone through a major heroin epidemic in the United States. And uh, President Nixon had launched what was initially a very innovative response to the problem. And there were a lot of changes that were going on. That was was a period of enormous ferment in drug treatment, drug policy, and a lot was going on, of course, with drug use itself. And so I just asked the question, how did we get into this situation? You know, if you go back 100, 150 years, 
what was it like? Why did some drugs become legal and others illegal? And those were just the basic questions I started with in the 1970s. Okay, interesting. Okay. And so then, in uh, especially in your most recent book, you jump into some very interesting terms. So you use this term limbic capitalism. And I think that that's probably what we're, we're especially interested in with the Food Junkies podcast. So do you want to f- <laughs> define, please, what limbic capitalism is? Uh, sure. It's a socially regressive business system that involves international corporations, typically, Often they are complicit with governments and sometimes even with criminal organizations. Mm -hmm. And they make money by getting us to overconsume or in some cases to addictively consume products. Not just drug products, but but now a whole range of products. Uh Um, Okay, so can you explain how that happens? So I know you have a term in there where you say that um, basically business taps into our pleasure circuitry. Do you want to go elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. It's called limbic capitalism for a reason. I I came up with that shorthand deliberately. Um, Uh The limbic part of our brain is indispensable for our survival. It it involves pleasure and motivation and uh, long-term memory. Uh, You couldn't get along without it. Unfortunately, these same pleasure and motivational circuits are capable of being exploited by others who don't necessarily have our long-term survival or best interests at heart. And while they're interested in making money. And that's really the key to this is that what limited capitalism does is essentially it profits by encouraging, I mean, some would even say hijacking Mm -hmm. our limbic system and then encouraging excess consumption. And then at the extreme, excessive consumption becomes addictive behavior. That's, That's one way. And in fact, I think a good way to think about addiction, excessive consumption to the point where it's harmful for us and for society. Yeah, and you and you have in uh, in your book that you actually impl- well, you state that there's sophisticated research to find ways to exploit this. So this is a deliberate intent to exploit us, our limbic system. Well, I would say it's an increasingly deliberate way to exploit us. I mean, there there are people have always uh, well, not always, but people have long given thought to how to make goods and services more enticing. But now it's reached the point where this is just very, very sophisticated. And uh, also, I mean, look, the people who put together seductive products understand neuroscience. It's not just the people at NIDA or it's not just the people who are working at universities who understand neuroscience. It's been clear for at least half a century that people in these industries have an increasingly sophisticated understanding of basic neuroscience and and what pushes our buttons in the limbic system. Okay. And you have a a term that you say capitalism's evil twin. Can you elaborate on that? You've got some great phrases. Well, well, thank you. So one of the things that I, I try to be clear about is that this book is not a diatribe against capitalism. I Like most historians, I see capitalism as, in many ways, a force for progress in history. I mean, you really don't want to live in a town that has one hardware store, and that hardware store is run by the government. There's, for certain basic commodities, rakes and plows and, you know, railroads and so on, competition is good. Competition of that of that sort is generally tied into economic growth and social progress. I, I don't think many historians would argue about that. Now, what they do argue about is how do you distribute the benefits of that economic growth, that's another question. But, but the idea that capitalism is in some way responsible for these momentous changes is, I think, fairly non-controversial. But <laughs> when you're talking about rakes and plows and railroads, that's one thing. But when you're talking about hyper palatable food or potentially addictive drugs or pornography or gambling or things of that nature, then the nature of the product itself leads to trouble, especially among those who are heavy consumers. And that's the the genesis of the evil twin comment. It's capitalism relentlessly applied to a certain range of products and services that causes these harms, not capitalism per se. 
Right. Okay. Well, I mean, in that same sort of paragraph, you imply that there's a kind of immorality that's that here, because it's not just, you know, the progress of history marching on. There's a, I mean, it, like that deliberate intent to cultivate addictive behavior, which is damaging, is it, there's an immorality that's implied here. Wouldn't you agree? Oh, sure. I mean, I look, the essential trade-off here is between private wealth on the one hand uh-huh. and public health on the other. Or if not private wealth, then then wealth that's generated by corporations and shared by the, the people who are vested in those corporations. And I'm very much on the side of public health. There's no question about that. But having said that, I ought to qualify it because I'm I'm not a Puritan or a prude either. I, I there's nothing wrong with people enjoying ice cream or or, you know, going to the movies or getting married in Las Vegas and going to a casino and then going home a few dollars shorter. I, these kinds of things seem to me to be non-problematic. Where you get into trouble is when industries understanding something called the Pareto principle, namely that most of their profits come from about 20% of their consumers. Uh-huh. When they target that group and encourage heavy consumption among those individuals, then you get very serious harms. And yes, indeed, I do think that that is a reprehensible conduct to do that. You know, I I just want to pick up on that, that the Pareto principle. I don't remember reading about that. That's really good. I mean, in the addiction world, I know that 80% of alcoholics or heavy drinkers are alcoholics and they fund the industry. And I'm assuming that that's the same with the food industry as well. So basically it's the food addicts that are supporting the food industry. Well, uh, not to some extent. Okay, so in the, with the case of alcohol, yeah, the vast majority of the revenue is produced by 20% of the drinkers. Right. 80% of the drinkers either drink infrequently or not at all. Mm-hmm. And then, but there's, there's 20%. And I think that's probably people who are consuming at least one or two drinks a day or more on okay. up to three, four, five. They provide most of the profits. Although I... I've not made uh, a similar study of the distribution of food profits. Um, Everybody has to eat. I mean, that seems to me to be the essential distinction between the two industries is that people are going to get food somewhere. But yes, you're right. Those people who are morbidly obese or in some way, shape or form food addicts are adding more to the bottom line of the industry than, than people who are normal eaters three times a day. I have a meal. I don't snack between. Yeah. I'm not, I'm not, you know, a big consumer of expensive or exotic foods. Those kinds of individuals uh, profit the industry, but a larger share and what that exact share is, I don't know, but a larger share of the profits are, are coming from the heavy consumers, obviously. Yeah. So I guess if we were thinking about uh, capitalism, the, the sort of uh, evil twin versus just capitalism, that would be like um, uh, if you're looking at the food industry, you know, organic versus non-organic would be, you know, we all have to eat and we all eat vegetables or many of us do. But the evil twin part is the part where they hijacked and they really um, making people, encouraging people to eat specific foods, not just in general. So that's that's where we get into the, the twin thing, right? Right. Well, let me go back to the, the first part of your very interesting question, which is what is the food industry? Farmers, yeah, farmers producing start. staples are not, well, I guess they're complicit in this in the sense that they're providing the raw ingredients. Mm-hmm. But that seems to me to be a very different sort of enterprise from a very sophisticated and very large food company that hires research scientists that have access to thousands of artificial flavors and figure out how to, and, and I'm sure you know Michael Moss's book, yeah. which is a, is, a, is a very good discussion of this. Yeah. We've spent a lot of time thinking about how do we put these things together to maximize the burst release of dopamine, uh-huh. okay, which is really the neural common denominator for all of these behaviors. And that's something I noticed, by the way, throughout history. So this book, The Age of Addiction, is, is fundamentally soup to nuts, you know, starting in prehistory and right yeah. on down to the present. How did, how did we get into this predicament? Yeah. And one of the things that I think it's important to understand, especially with respect to food addiction, is that a lot of the 
technological advance and the seductiveness of food comes from blending. Mm. So it's not just that you you add salt or you invent the potato chip or you do this or that. It, it's that you you bring these things together. All right. And then packaging becomes part of this and marketing becomes part of this. Mm-hmm. And and it's the same thing with, for example, casino gambling. All right. Now, are some people addicted to video poker? Yes. But when you go into a casino, it's about a lot more than video poker. It's about alcohol in Las Vegas. It's about smoking. Uh, it, it's it's about um, restaurants. Uh, it's about sex. Uh, historically, casinos have been uh, places of prostitution or or easy sexual availability of one sort or another. And so, what limbic capitalists do is they create what I call either blended hedonic environments like That's a casino. That's a great way to put it. Yeah, you got yeah, where, where, you know, where there are all, all kinds of pleasures on offer. Come, yeah. come to Las Vegas and you'll get more than gambling, right? Yeah. Uh, or, or they create blended hedonic products. And this blending, for practical purposes, it doesn't really know any bounds. I mean, now think about the people who are putting together legalized cannabis Oh, I was going to get to that. Yes. Well, with food. All right. So, so you've you've got something that's already hyper palatable. Yeah. And you know, let's add a good dollop of THC to the mix. Yeah. And see what we get. So this is one way that limbic capitalism is advancing, if that's the right word. It's uh, by constantly adding new ingredients and new dimensions to the uh, pleasure experience. Yeah, you know, I was going to ask you about the marijuana thing and how that fits. I, I think that you've just described it so well. I mean, it's so it's such a, a, an industry in and of itself in the last couple of years. And adding it to food, you know, edibles, I mean, you've got it right there. You're getting the tasty brownie along with the heightened experience, which will just make you want to eat, any, eat more. Like, I, I don't know, what's, I fear what's going to become of us as a people <laughs> with this new advance. Well, and there's something that's even creepier about this, I think, which is that who likes gummies? Who likes edibles? Oh, yes. Answer, kids. Yes. And another principle of limited capitalism is you want to get them started young. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the sooner you can start somebody on a smartphone or the sooner you can start them smoking or using drugs or drinking alcohol, every study that I know of shows that that's the group in which you're going to have problematic behavior emerge later on. The sooner you start... Uh, the sooner you you train your brain to respond to these these substances and develop the conditioned responses, the more likely you are to develop a full blown addiction. Yeah, and so you, I, I heard you say smartphones. So I mean, we were starting with the concept of edibles, gummies, because we know kids are eating candy and stuff, but we're also giving them smartphones at a ridiculously early age. And for sure, you get the dopamine ping with that. And isn't that just a, a, a gateway to further addiction in the future? Well, that's actually a, a complicated question. So let me unpack that. Okay. Uh, when, when we talk about digital addictions, Yes. I mean, there, there are conditioned responses people have to the hardware itself. There are people who feel phantom vibrations when they have the, yeah. you know, the smartphone in the hip and they think it's going off and they've got to check their, their news yeah. feed or whatever. The technology itself is in some sense, if not addictive, then certainly deeply habit forming. And that in turn is, um, made more salient by the fact that it's hard to live a normal social life without access to this technology. But then another way to think about internet connected devices, not just smartphones, but the laptop that I'm, I'm using to converse with you, any, any internet connected device is that it also facilitates the transmission of other more traditional vices so pornography would be an obvious example. Gambling would be an yeah. obvious example. You can find all kinds of videos about how to, how to grow cannabis, how to use cannabis, how to inject uh-huh. drugs, how to synthesize your own drugs. All of these things are there. And uh, cooking shows, cooking shows. <laughs> well, okay. So here's Crazy where I back. Off. <laughs> okay. 
here's where I back off a little bit. Like, okay. I like Julia Child. You know, I, okay. I, you know, one part of me thinks that Julia Child was some kind of a hero and an innovator. And by gosh, you know, there's nothing wrong with enjoying a good French meal. But if you look at something like Mukbang, which is this this genre of television program, I'm sorry, a YouTube programs typically that originated in Korea, where it's nothing but people eating, often socially social media influencers who are eating food and they're conversing and telling you how much you enjoy it, and they have these enormous plates of food. Wow, they really? Consume. Oh yeah! Oh oh oh! Gosh, uh, you should do a, a podcast. I'm not aware on of this Mukbang. phenomenon. M u k b a n g is probably the most common spelling. I'm sure that many of your listeners will be familiar with this. But yeah. you can literally go on the internet and watch people consume plate after plate of delicious food, and they they do this for hours at a time. Wow! Now you tell me that that's not a cue for somebody who has an eating disorder. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. That, that's a kind and, of food pornography as far as I'm concerned. Well, and, and even if it's not, it's a time waster to beat all time wasters. <laughs> so there's the so-called time suck aspect of digital addictions where you, whether you're addicted or not, and we can have an argument over what exactly constitutes addiction as opposed to heavy consumption. Uh-huh. It's still time that you're spending on device where you're not doing something else that might in fact be better for your mental development or your health. Right. Like going out and running or reading a book. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, well, that, that really illustrates how ubiquitous this phenomena is becoming. I mean, it almost seems like it's a driver of the 21st century. That That's my experience that my work as an addictions physician, it's, it's never ending. Like it literally is never ending. It seems like around the corner is yet something else. It's going to demand even more time, like the cannabis picture. And now you've just told me about something else in the food addiction world that I wasn't even aware of. But can we just back up a little bit? So we're sort of talking about social forces. You, you mentioned a really interesting, like sort of early pre 20th century, like this concept of the pro vice activism versus is the anti-vice activism, that there's a fundamental difference in an awareness of, of our addiction and our addressing addictions. And can you elaborate a bit on that? Sure. So in the 19th century and the early 20th century, the stakes were raised by technology. So people were aware of addictive behavior going back hundreds, if not thousands of years. I mean, you can find ancient accounts of gambling addiction. Certainly people in the 17th century, when tobacco started to spread throughout Europe and China, there are many, many accounts of uh, what we would today call nicotine addiction. Now, they didn't necessarily use the word addiction. They might use a metaphor like slavery or enslaved to tobacco or something of that nature. Did you, let me just interrupt. Did you ever see anything uh, in that context about food, food enslavement or something like that? The only thing I've seen is that an awareness of people's teeth getting worse. But do you ever recall anything like that? Well, there's certainly, I'm thinking now of uh, Roman literature, which I probably know best. There are many, many references to gluttony and gluttonous behavior, uh, especially in the satires. But that's probably anachronistic to label that as an addiction. But certainly gluttony was considered to be a vice and, in fact, a deadly sin. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, people were aware of of overeating, although they didn't necessarily put the label compulsive or or addictive on it. But to return to the the point about anti-vice activism, all right, something a little something happens in history called the Industrial Revolution. So let's take cigarettes as an example. The very first cigarette machine, which was invented and came online in what was patented, I think, in 1881, produces 200 cigarettes a minute. By the 1930s, Germany had a cigarette machine that could turn out something like 3,000 or more cigarettes per minute. I mean, I I forget the exact number, but it was this tremendous increase in productive capacity. Uh, and, And you see this with alcohol as another good example. It became much, much cheaper to produce alcohol in the late 19th and the early 20th century. And a lot of this cheap gin was shipped around the world. And with that increase in supply, and this, I think this is fundamentally a story about supply and marketing. Given what we know about neuroscience, you put together the neuroscience with increased exposure, increased supply, declining declining price, and aggressive marketing. 
guess what you get? You get more addiction. And people were quite aware of that in the late 19th and early 20th century. And the result of that growing awareness, which was true both in the religious communities and in the scientific community, was a transnational movement, which I call global anti-vice activist. Hmm. So all kinds of people that you would not ordinarily associate were, in fact, part of this movement. So if, if I say the name Kerry Nation, you think of a famous American prohibitionist. But if I say Mahatma Gandhi, you probably think of an Indian nationalist hero. But in fact, he was one of the leading alcohol prohibitionists, if not the leading alcohol prohibitionist in the world. I didn't know that. In the early 20th century. Exactly. This, this is a broad international movement where people want to crack down commercialized vice. They would have said commercialized vice, by which they meant things like saloons, cheap alcoholic beverages, yeah. prostitution, gambling. There's this, this broad, multifaceted reform push, which, which really reaches its zenith in the first two decades of the 20th century, which not coincidentally is the time when many countries, including, I guess, most famously, the United States, experiment with beverage alcohol prohibition. So if there's a moment moment in history when the forces of science and medicine in a somewhat uneasy alliance with religious conservatives are pushing back against commercialized vice and having success, it's this time period. It's the late 19th and the early 20th century. Pro-vice activism refers to the response of the commercial vice industries after that. So starting in the 20s and 30s, if not before, you've got people who are saying, wait a minute, we're losing tax revenue from alcohol. You get rid of the alcohol industry, well, you're going to have to raise taxes on something else. Or wait a minute, what about gambling? We can make lots of money for the state to finance education and, and other worthy projects if we legalize gambling. Uh, so there, there, are, there, it's not just the limbic capitalists who are doing this. They yeah. find allies in governments, which would rather tax vices than, uh, than necessarily raise everybody's income tax or the sales tax on, on general merchandise. So the story is more complicated than that, obviously. But suffice it to say that by the 60s, 70s, and 80s, the pro-vice activists had triumphed. So if you look at what happened with, say, lotteries in the United States between the early 1960s and the 1980s, practically no state has the lottery in the early 1960s. And by the 1980s and 1990s, they practically all do. Yeah. So you, you can see this expansion of what at least used to be called vice activities like gambling. Uh, same thing with casinos, which become a global phenomenon during the late 20th century. And then on top of that, you get the digital revolution as well, which then magnifies this and, and takes addiction in directions other than the traditional ones of gambling and so on. Right. Now, I'm just thinking with um, when we talk about how can we resolve some of the some of the sugar issues, one of the things we're suggesting is maybe we should tax our our sugars like our pops and our candies at a much higher rate to dissuade people. But the way you're talking, it almost seems like that's not going to make any difference. It's actually going to get the government more on board to not want to sort of make some of these foods illegal or problematic in the way that we're now doing with tobacco. Like taxing just simply isn't enough. I mean, is that so? Oh, no, I, I actually think that sugar taxes, which, by the way, have been adopted in, yes. in a number of municipalities and countries with some success in the last 10 or 15 years, I think sugar taxes are, are a viable policy alternative. So it's not but they're, they're politically sensitive. I mean, are, are you as a as let's say a Democratic candidate facing reelection in 2022? Are you really going to propose a sugar tax at a moment in history when the inflation rate is above eight percent? So there are there are other considerations, but generally speaking, okay. generally speaking, tax policy is a viable approach 
to reducing the harms of limit capitalism. Yeah, I mean, I, I would have said so, but it's just as you were saying that, I mean, if it's actually a, a form of income, like lottery is for the government, it, it's not going to be in their interest to actually deny this or make it too difficult for industry to continue. But anyway, okay. Well, but although there's a catch, you know, I we know from the history of tobacco control, which by the way, is one of the, the great global success stories. Yes. It's, it's why you and your listeners should not be listening to me as an historian telling you about all these forces that have made limbic capitalism more and more triumphant. Remember, there are public health success stories here, and, and certainly raising taxes on cigarettes was part of that. The problem is, if you raise taxes too high, then the other actor, the illicit sector, steps in and starts to take over the trade. And right. that's typically, then you have less use, maybe diminished prevalence in terms of addiction, but the harms that are associated with the black market make make each case of addiction that much more problematic. The other problem with tax policy is something that economists call cross-border effects, so that for years there's been a lively cigarette smuggling industry in the United States based yeah. on the fact that taxes in, say, New York may be much higher than in, in an adjacent state. So people will load up with cigarettes in one place and go sell them in another place and realize profit. That's, I think it was John Stuart Mill who once said that if you raise the tax on something high enough, especially for the ordinary working man, at some point it becomes a prohibition. Yeah. So that, that's something you've got to look out for. If you, if you really jack up the tax to an extreme, then you're going to be dealing with the other side of the coin, which I mentioned earlier, the illicit sector. So it's not just yeah. legal corporations that do this. You also have criminal organizations that are involved as well. Okay. So, so the title of your last book, like basically uh, bad habits becoming big business. So it does seem that in the last 20, 30 years, uh, what was already, I guess, this pro vice as opposed to anti vice has really culminated. And so that now to me, it just seems ever more prevalent. And do you have any uh, further comments about that? Like, are we truly in an age of addiction now where we weren't before? Well, I first, let me, let me say, in all candor, there was a huge debate at the press, at Harvard University Press, over what to call the book. And okay. I ended up calling it The Age of Addiction, How Bad Habits Became Big Business. Several of the editors wanted to call the book Limbic Capitalism. Uh, it's which, a great title. You know, it, no, it, it, okay, it's a good title for you because you are a sophisticated person who deals in the world of neuroscience and addiction. Yeah. You, you instantly get. Yeah. But the question is, is, is does somebody who does not have that background get the title? So in the end, the, the more general title won out. But let me tell you why I still think it's a good title, which is I started this, as I said earlier, I started off you know, writing about drugs, especially opiates. And then I, it dawned on me that over time that while drug addiction was still a huge, huge problem, now people were talking more and more about gambling addiction or food addiction. Nora Volkoff, who, who, yeah. is, who is, is the, the head of the National Institute on Drug Abuse, mm -hmm. is one of the leading figures in the world in terms of, of raising awareness about food addiction. I know she's our hero. Well, all right. OK, but, but think about that for a minute. That, that's an interesting change for an historian. Here's a person who is an employee of the federal government of the United States, whose job it is to run the National Institute on Drug Abuse, mm -hmm. who is giving TED Talks on food addiction. Now, what that tells you is that in the eyes of many people, certain kinds of hyperpalatable food have become drugs and have drug-like effects. Yeah. All right. So anyway, so I, I started this just simply observing that, wow, when people talk about addiction, they mean many more things than, than the kinds of traditional psychoactive substances that I've studied in my career. And so I, I came to this with a little bit of skepticism. Is this just hype or... Is it really the case that addictions are proliferating and, and becoming more of a public health burden? And I, I, you know, whatever skepticism I may have had at the beginning, I had largely lost by the time I published the book, because it, I think it's pretty clear that, yes, indeed, the number and type and the seriousness of addictions has has worsened in the last 40 years.
Yeah. And so you mentioned some pieces, like you've already mentioned the availability of all of these substances. So we're talking about gambling, we're talking about pornography, we're talking about foods. There's so much availability. And then you also mentioned the, uh, that sort of drug engineering or the, the uh, all of these things. So you have faster gaming machines than ever before. Uh, opiates have become ever more potent. Like in the space of two to three years, we've gone from you know, the lot of carfentanil, like, I mean, things have become so potent and then foods as well, highly potent. Yeah. I mean, I mean, just, just if I, if I may interject something yes, here, I, I, I think you make an excellent point about what's happened with opioids. Yeah. Um, when people use drugs non-medically in the 19th century, you know, there were a few people who experimented with laudanum and uh, yeah, other, right. other medicinal opiates. And then if, from the 1850s on, there were people who would sometimes hang out in opium dens and they would smoke opium. Compare that to fentanyl or, or carfentanil and think about the fact that it's not just that it's, oh, it's been added to heroin or to counterfeit opioid analgesics. It's been added to cocaine. It's been added to all kinds of other drugs. And so people are dropping dead mm -hmm. uh, or and well, they're, they're either becoming addicted to fentanyl through other kinds of, of drug use, or they're just dying because they don't know that, that the cocaine they're sniffing has been cut with, with say, fentanyl or carfentanil. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the reality of it is there just there is no such thing as safe recreational drug use anymore. And that is, in many ways, a concomitant of technological change and this revolution in cheap synthetic drugs, yeah. most, most notably methamphetamine and fentanyl, yeah. as analogs that we've experienced in the last five or 10 years. Yeah, I'm, I'm really glad you made that connection with crystal meth as well. Like the, the, those are the extremes. And uh, it's, yeah, you're right. Recreational drug use has become just dangerous all around. And, you know, I, I appreciate that sugar may not have the same immediate threat to it, but it too is becoming ultra, ultra, ultra processed and ever more sick. I, I, yeah, wanna... I, I, think, I, I think the thing about sugar is that it kills you more slowly. Yes. Exactly. <laughs> I mean, there is a, a bit of epidemiology in the book. And I went back and I looked at 2016 World Health Organization data. And I wanted to compare two things. I wanted to compare premature deaths, which the World Health Organization defines as occurring before the age of 70. Mm -hmm. The number of premature deaths that could be linked to bad habits like overeating or drug use and so on, versus the number of people who died in wars or through <laughs> homicide. Now, admittedly, the data is a little bit dirty here. We're dealing with less than perfect data. But even so, what I found was a 30 to 1 difference. The number of people who died prematurely wow. due to habits like overeating or smoking or drug use, it was roughly 30 times the number of people who died prematurely before the age of 70 from homicide or war-related violence. Yeah. yeah. This, is, this is WHO data. Yeah. I mean, so, basically self-destructive. <laughs> so, I, I mean, the, the difference is, look, if you snort cocaine that is laced with fentanyl and you're 21 years old, you're dead at 21. If you succumb to diabetes when you're 65 years old, yeah, you've lived longer, but who wants to die at 65, given the, the possibility for a much longer and happier and healthier life if you can avoid the snares that are out there? Yeah, which I want to actually get to. You have a wonderful, another wonderful phrase, which is consumerist dystopia. So you mentioned that, you know, this prevalence, we're in an age of addiction, and that one of the issues is, is we simply, you might decide, like you and I are aware of this, so we're just going to opt out. We're just going to say, well, we just won't eat the sugar. We won't smoke the, the dope. We won't do whatever it is. But that's becoming more and more difficult to do. Uh, so can I, I want to just give this quote, because I, I love this. It says, we swim in a sea of sharp hooks everywhere these hooks that you were just alluding to. 50 years ago, the main hooks were drugs and alcohol. They were the primary addictive threats. But now there's been this tremendous multiplication of hooks in our consumerist sea. Do you want to add something to that? Yes. Uh, I think that some of the hooks are harder to avoid than others. Yeah. So I, I think that certainly young people are becoming more aware that there are a lot of drugs on the street that can kill you. And that if you, you're, you're buying a what you think is a tablet of oxycodone, it may not be oxycodone. It, mm. it may be some unknown amount of fentanyl. That kind of information is 
getting out there. And I, I think over time, consumers do become aware of dangers. But if you think about the information that, that's all over the airwaves, literally about digital addictions, okay? Yeah. Or for that matter, food addiction. Yes. How do you avoid digital technologies? Yes. Or how do you avoid eating? Uh, well, you can avoid eating sugar, but how do you avoid eating sugar when it's everywhere? Exactly, exactly. And so it's a hard problem. And, and so one review of my book made a really good point. He said, one way to think about this problem is that there are opt-in and there are opt-out technologies. Mm-hmm. Now, cocaine is a technology that you have to choose to opt into. I mean, if you go to a party and sniff cocaine that may or may not have fentanyl in it, uh, well, that, that, that's, you don't have to do that. It's not like the air you breathe, right? Mm-hmm. On the other hand, if you're going to get away from hyperpalatable food or digital technologies, you almost have to make an incredibly difficult decision to opt out of those things. And it's much harder to do, which is what I meant when there, that some hooks are, are more easily avoided than others. And I look, I freely admit that I find myself developing certain habits around smartphone use that I didn't have three or four years ago. I find it probably happens to you too, that you will reach instinctively to, to check, to see, what's happening with this, or has so-and-so gotten in touch with me? Uh, and it, it's sneaky. It really sneaks up on you. And that's why I want to emphasize that the fact that you're consuming something more heavily doesn't necessarily mean that it's an addiction, because not all of these uses of smartphone technology, or for that matter, not all enjoyment of, of a hyperpalatable food is necessarily bad. But what's so clear to me, and, I, and I'm sure that, that you as a clinician are aware of this constantly, is that, you know, what happens to the people at the far end of that consumption spectrum? It absolutely takes over their lives, can ruin and shorten their lives. And that's what the problem is. Yeah, for sure. And actually, that leads to my next question, which you have another concept that's called the problem profits. So that uh, <laughs> even in trying to fix the problem, we get caught up in this whole whirlwind. So did you want to elaborate a little bit on that, what you mean by that? And uh, I can ask you more after that. Well, sure. Well, Vera, you're a problem prophet in a way. I, uh, yeah. So, you know, one of the things that, that I learned in my in Forces of Habit, my, my global history of drug use, and, and that was born home to me again when I started writing about other kinds of addictive substances and behaviors. It's like an economic perpetual motion machine, okay? It's just fascinating to me how these externalities that are constantly thrown off by limit capitalism lead to opportunities for other people. So, I mean, off the top of my head, uh, one of my sons is a transplant pulmonologist, and what he, what he does is, is, is wonderful. I mean, he can extend people's lives by being part of a team that gets them new lungs if they, if they have advanced lung disease. But when I speak to him on the phone, and I, his name is Andrew, I say, Andrew, where do you get the lungs? Well, increasingly, we're getting them from people who die of drug overdoses. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so it's a bizarre, but, but also a very sharp illustration of the point that one kind of industry, in this case, an illicit industry of selling fentanyl and and various street drugs, ties into another industry, which in some sense derives benefit from it. I mean, there are some people who will live longer because they got those lungs. There are some people who will earn money for the medical services that they provide. (laughs) And it's almost like a dog chasing its tail, if you know what I mean. There's all of these secondary and even tertiary enterprises that come about as a result of the, this excessive and, and even compulsive consumption. Yeah. So just, just to be more specific for our listeners, that would include like, you know, in the realm of food addiction, that would include the whole diabetic industry. So all, all of the medications, all the doctors who deal with that, all the doctors who deal with bariatric surgery, me, the, uh, the, the addiction physicians, even this podcast. I mean, we're all, we're all uh, you know, having come from the problem and in some way profiting from it, either through reputation or payment. And even something like the sweetener industry, wouldn't you say? 
Oh, yeah, sure. I mean, artificial sweeteners, that's a classic example, or light beer. Uh, yeah, exactly. So, you know, or public relations firms that will print up right. those little flyers that you see in casinos saying, do you have a, think you have a gambling problem? Well, here's a hotline number that you can call. And yeah. <laughs> you know, somebody got paid to design those to sign those brochures. Sure, you can just go on uh, multiplying examples. So just to, uh, like, because you talked about opiates and that was your initial interest area, would you say that the sort of, um, the last 20 year concept of harm reduction is another example of a problem profit or not? The idea of there's an addiction, there's not much we can do about it, so let's try to prolong it, but in a safe way. That's a hard question. I mean, a harm reduction is something that has many aspects. I know people who were pioneers in needle and syringe exchange. Yeah. And, you know, they were out there on a cold day in Pittsburgh or, or, or similar city talking to people, handing out sterile equipment and bleach and, all, and, and talking to people and then trying to get them into treatment and all the rest of that. I mean, a lot of that was initially volunteer work by some very committed people. Yeah. And to say that that is a form of profiteering is, I don't know, but is buprenorphine a profitable drug that Purdue Pharma actually once considered adding to its own portfolio Mm. of drugs under the auspices of something called Project Tango? Yeah. I mean, there's there's money to be made from buprenorphine. So, so yes, uh, drug treatment and more generally other addiction treatment programs would, would fall under that rubric, I think. Yeah. Okay. Although it, remember, it's important here to say that something is a problem profit is mm-hmm. not necessarily to condemn it across yeah. the board. Right. People get into trouble and, and people do go into treatment and people do turn their lives around. Yeah. And they or their families paid money for that. And it it may have been a life-saving investment. On the other hand, there are plenty of treatment facilities that are basically rip-off joints. Yeah, that's right. Uh, So so it's going to depend on the uh, particular details. Okay, so so now let's move into the solution. So if it was initially pro or anti-vice and now it's pro-vice, should we go back to the anti-vice? I mean, like Food Junkies podcast, what, one of the things that we advocate for is, you know, to, to identify what the trigger foods are, not all foods, obviously, but the trigger foods that make a person go to that end stage that you had actually described well and abstain from them, like learn how to abstain, stop the addiction in its tracks, which sounds like a, a prohibitionist stand of, you know, 100 years ago. So do we need to go back to that? Or like, what's what's your concept of a solution? How do we get out of this momentum? Or will just history carry on in the way that Tolstoy seems to imply, you know, it just carries on and there's not much we can do. At least that was my reading. Oh, no, I think there is plenty that we can do. Oh, and, and I think that there's a spectrum of things we can do that go from basically non-coercive to highly coercive. Okay. So you gave the example, you you said that in your podcast, you try to warn people about trigger foods. Yes. All right. That's educational. Yeah. There, there's no coercion that's involved in that. People are listening to you, Vera, as an expert, and you're telling them, all right, this is what I would avoid to avoid these cues. Good information. Yeah. But if you start advocating for not selling sugary products to anyone under the age of 10. I like that or, idea. I admit it. Well, all right. Okay. Now, go ahead. These are hypothetical examples. Yeah, or yeah. You, you go beyond that and say, and even if you are over the age of 10, you're going to have to pay a heavy tax on the sugar product. Or right? here's, a, here's another one I've heard. The Children's Aid Society will actually take away the kid if the parent is feeding them too much sugar. I've heard that one. Yeah. Oh, let's, let, you know, as long as we're inventing things, why, why, how about this one? If your body mass index is above a certain oh, cutoff point, huh. you either can't buy your sugary products or you have to pay double the tax. Okay. All the way up to let's make sugar a Schedule One controlled substance under the Controlled Substances Act of 1970. Okay. <laughs> now, which I think would be ridiculous, but you see what I'm saying? Yeah. When, you, when you talk about anti-vice activism, you're really describing a range of options which go from simple exhortation, don't do this, it's wrong, it's unhealthful, it's sinful, to all the way up to 
either de facto prohibition through heavy taxation or de jure prohibition through actually listing something as a controlled substance. Those are the range of choices. Now, I think that we're where we need to be is is in the middle of that spectrum. I think there are lots of clever things you can do that stop short of uh, full-blown government attempts at prohibition, which carry their own cost. Now, let's, let's not forget okay. that the second you go into full anti-vice prohibitionist mode, you're going to get people working in the cracks who are going to be selling these products illegally. So yeah. you've got all the corruption and all the other violence and all the things that go with black markets. Well, give me a couple of what you think is a reasonable. Well, uh, okay. So one of the examples I use in the book is sarcasm and satire. So I, among the most effective tools uh, that were uh, used against multinational tobacco companies uh, Mm. were graffiti campaigns where, for example, in Australia, tobacco Mm. billboards were marked up. This was a crime, technically. People went and they vandalized these billboards and they they turned these advertisements in for various brands of cigarettes into these kind of lurid anti-smoking messages with the help of, of cans of spray paint. And that caught the public's attention, you know, uh-huh. uh, that sort of bold, cheeky action touched people in Australia. And eventually, Australia got around to banning all advertisements for tobacco products except at the point of sale. So there's an example of, of where a, a kind of bold gesture using satirical graffiti to deface tobacco product billboards triggered a broader movement, which yeah. did, did culminate in a real restriction, a ban on most forms of tobacco advertising that had demonstrable public health effects. So we need a, is it Bronsky? Who's that guy that does the graffiti on out, out of the blue? We need some oh, Bank, Banksy. 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 For, You're thinking for, for, Banksy. We need, we need a Banksy, Banksy for food. For food yeah, actually, actually, actually I, I think probably if you went through the collected works of, of Banksy, you would find a great many that in some way, shape, or form uh, satirize various dimensions of limbic capitalism. And in fact, there's a, in the book, there's a, a one of a famous Banksy sculpture that I use to illustrate that this kind of satire of consumer excess. Okay, great. Can you give us one more thing? I, I know we're running out of time, so give me. <laughs> sure. You had, uh, uh, I don't know, the tax policy. I think you mentioned something like that. Oh, well, I'll just reiterate that point. I think that if you're a middle of the rotor, that rather than prohibit something outright, generally the first thing you want to do is, is, is try to, to increase taxes. But that's not enough. I mean, you need to, I mean, yeah. if, again, if you look at the cigarette campaign, anti-vice activists did favor increased taxes on cigarettes, Hmm. but they also made very effective use of public health announcements, okay, about the dangers of smoking. And so it's that kind of combined approach. And then also it's important for your listeners to understand that you get generational effects. So that if, if, if you start to make these products more expensive, and you start to hit young people early with clever propaganda that's designed to, you know, don't let them make a sucker out of you yeah. and all that. That's going to have an effect which may not be felt until years later. So one thing that commonly happens is that, mm-hmm. and you can certainly see this with cigarette smoking, is, is that a generation that was thoroughly hooked by the the, the marketing efforts of the tobacco industry they're eventually going to die. And then as younger people came along in an era when the dangers of combustible tobacco products were emphasized, as they come of age, you're you're going to have less of that behavior. So it's not like you're you're necessarily going to succeed simultaneously with every age segment in the population. Right. But you got to start somewhere. Yeah. And and the other thing you mentioned is the class action suits. And, uh, you know, a great example of that would be uh, with the fentanyl and uh, Purdue company where we really nailed them finally. And we're, you know, getting them ever more. And, you know, eventually maybe something like that can happen in the, with the sugar industry too. I don't well, know. Well, in the, in the interest of disclosure, I, su- I should say that I am an expert witness for the plaintiff's in the national opioid litigation and have testified in several trials. And that's another thing. Although as important as I think that effort is, and as as 
much as I think the opioid manufacturers, distributors, and national pharmacies have to answer for. Boy, it, it would have been nice if we could have prevented that situation in the first place. I mean, yeah, that, that's yeah. something, mass litigation, mass torts, that's a not the world's best way to deal with a public health problem. I think that right. through taxes, through public health messaging, through education, these are the, the sorts of things that if you can prevent the problem from happening in the first place, hmm. better that that should happen, better that primary prevention right. should solve the problem than a bunch of lawyers and judges and jurors and expert witnesses like me should get together 30 years later and, and try to figure out who's going to pay for the mess. Okay. That really is the long way around the barn. Okay, good. So for our listeners, The Age of Addiction, How Bad Habits Became Big Business is a must read in terms of giving a, a really good context to basically limbic capitalism. What is next for you? Or is that going to be the culmination of your career? Because it is a really fine book. Well, I published years ago, in fact, my first book was called Dark Paradise, which is a history of opiate addiction in mm -hmm. the United States. And I, having become a kind of participant observer in the opioid crisis and knowing a lot about what's happened in the last 20 years, mm -hmm. I think maybe I would like to go back and explain how opiate addiction became opioid addiction mm. that is largely based on synthetic or syn semi-synthetic drugs in the last 20 or 25 years. So that if I have another book in me, I think that's probably what it would be about. Okay, good. Thank you. And so we have a signature question, a final question, if you don't mind. What would you tell a younger version of yourself about addiction or maybe the historical perspective around addiction? <laughs> Something along that line. Uh, Something that uh, you've learned over the years. Sure. So I would tell myself that I was wrong about heroin being the king of addictions. I, uh, when I was doing my research on the history of opiate addiction in the United States back in the 70s and 80s, I used to think that everything else was candy. You know, it's <laughs> like, like, ah, you want to talk about real addiction? All right. I've interviewed dozens of people who had serious heroin habits and I've you know read all the medical literature and I, I know a lot about addiction to powerful opiates like heroin. That's really addiction. You know, <laughs> I don't want to hear about gambling addiction and sugar addiction, you know, forget about it. it, it <laughs> I, I was absolutely convinced that addiction was about hard drugs. And that was that was just a function of where my own research energy was focused. I, I had blinkers on. Uh -huh. Well, I would like to tell my younger self that those blinkers have been removed. <laughs> <laughs> okay. <laughs> and? And so we, we truly are living in, in an age of addiction in which for economic and technological and social and other reason, uh, reasons, the the situation has just, just become much more complex and, and much more serious. I mean, look, debt is debt. If you kill yourself through yeah. distracted driving because you've got your, your nose stuck in your smartphone and you're driving 55 miles an hour and you crash into a, a light pole, you're dead. If you die of a heroin overdose, you're dead. I mean, I think we need to understand yeah. that uh, there are, are a lot of compulsive, harmful behaviors that can end your life. And I think we also need to understand that those behaviors are not simply a function of a bunch of criminals who are holed up someplace in Mexico making methamphetamine or fentanyl in a warehouse, but that it's much broader than that, that there's this whole very sophisticated, licit corporate side to that enterprise as well which is essentially that evil twin of capitalism. Well, thank you so much, David Courtright, for your time today. And uh, listeners, please read, the, especially his last book, The Age of Addiction, How Bad Habits Become Big Business, because it is ever pertinent to our, our discussion as well. So thank you very much, David. Yeah, and don't forget, the book is funny too. There's a certain amount of black humor in it. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and lots of quotable quotes. Okay. All right, and thank you, Vera. I appreciate yeah, thank, it. Thank you. Bye. Thanks for joining us this week on Food Junkies, Recovery from Food Addiction. Make sure to join our Facebook group, Sugar Free for Life Support Group, I'm Sweet Enough.
You can subscribe to our show in iTunes or Stitchers. That way you'll never miss an episode. While you're at it, if you found value in this show, we'd appreciate a rating on iTunes. Or if you'd simply tell a friend about the show, that would help us out too. Don't forget to pick up your copy of Dr. Tarman's book, Food Junkies, which is available on Amazon. If you have any additional questions, both Molly and Clarissa are food addiction professionals and work one-on-one with clients. You can find their websites and email addresses in the show notes. Be sure to tune in every Friday when our new episodes drop. As Vera loves to say, the power is ours. <laughs>